Hi, it's Jerry Roberts again, uh, and I'm back with our series of community conversations about coronavirus and with policymakers who are responding to it. And today we're really honored to be joined by Paul Casey, uh, Santa Barbara City Administrator. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jerry. So what are you doing? Are you at work most days? Are you down at City Hall? Or are you out of, at home? Or how's that going for you? I, I work wherever I am. Seems like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is unlike uh, anything I've experienced. I do come into the office and try to coordinate as much as I can out of the office, but I'm working from home when I'm home as well. Uh, okay. Um, just, you know, I think some people don't really understand the way city government works, but this, this, the charter, the city charter says the city administrators shall be responsible to the city council for the proper administration of all affairs of the city. That's a lot of stuff, all affairs of the city. How do you define your job? Is it your job to lead and direct the council or to be led by them? So we're in a council manager form of government. It's been around for about 100 years, and most cities the size of Santa Barbara have this type of government. You might see a strong mayor form of government in a larger city like Los Angeles. But the premise is, is that the city council is elected by the public, and they hire two employees. They hire a city attorney to be their legal advisor, and they hire a city manager or city administrator to run the day-to-day -day operations of the city. Uh, but the city council are the elected officials. They're the one who set the policy and set the guidance about where the city is supposed to go. I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the city and implement that policy. Okay, well, let's talk about this unprecedented moment that we're in. So we got the biggest public health emergency probably since the polio epidemic of the 50s. Mm -hmm the largest economic collapse since the Great Recession, at least 22,000 jobs lost already, another 20,000 projected in, in May in the county. And then, you know, this is all on top of, a, you know, more recent disasters, the Thomas Fire, the debris flow. And of course, we have this ongoing decline of the downtown brick and mortar retail sector that's sort of been at the core of the debate about, you know, where does the, the city go from here? So what is your vision for how Santa Barbara gets out of this? And where do you see us in five years? <laughs> how did you enjoy the play, <laughs> Mrs. Lincoln? Exactly. You know, and, and I'll add in on top of that, the third prong is facing the largest financial impact of city revenues, uh, probably in the history of the city. So a three prong disaster hitting us. The public health response that we're dealing with right now, uh, the economic challenges that we had before that are only magnified by this complete shutdown, uh, while looking at a drop of $30 million in revenues to the city of Santa Barbara and having to adjust uh, the city's organization on top of all that. So that is extremely challenging. Uh, five years from now, Jerry, I haven't thought a lot about five years from now because I am managing in the moment and trying to understand where we're gonna be six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. Uh, there's so much uncertainty. There's so much unknown uh, that we're all working under, and that's all of us. You know, it's us in the public sector, it's us in the private sector. Quite honestly, it's leadership at the state and the federal government as well. Uh, that we're going to have to be nimble and adjust as we go along and do the best we can to to pull ourselves out of this hole. It's going to take all hands on deck and all hands on deck working together uh, to make it happen. Okay, let's talk about the thirty million dollar loss of, of revenue. So that's for the current fiscal year, which ends June 30th, and the new fiscal year, which begins July 1. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is the best estimate we have today. We will get more information as we keep going along. Uh, the city has kind of three prime revenue sources, property tax, which is fairly stable for now. It usually lags economic activity. So we think we'll see the impact of property tax later. Bed tax is instantaneous and it's completely dropped off and fully expect that to be slow to recover. That's and then the sales- Hotel tax, basically. Hotel tax. And then sales tax is the other major revenue and that has been hit substantially hard as well. And so our, we run on fiscal years uh, that ends June 30th. And so we're expecting about a $15 million loss just to the general fund. The general fund includes services for police and fire and parks and recreation and libraries and such. And then about another $15 million during the next fiscal year 
uh, which quite honestly is our best estimate at this time, because I don't think anyone knows what the recovery is going to look like, how we start unwinding from this shutdown, and how slow or how quick that might occur. So obviously the biggest portion of the city budget is salaries and benefits. You've already said you're going to take a pay cut and mm -hmm. kind of lead the way there. But the city can't act unilaterally because you have all of these contracts with unions. How many, how many union contracts are you, do you have to deal with and where does that stand? Yeah, great question. So uh, yeah, the general fund in particular is about 75 to 80% uh, salaries and benefits. We are a service organization uh, and it's driven by people. Over half of that uh, is police and fire alone. So public safety takes up about 55% of our general fund budget. And then as you mentioned, to look at concessions from labor units, we are required to negotiate with them and we are doing so. We've got about five active uh, labor units. We've got uh, SCIU, which represents the general employees. We have the Police Officers Association for the Police Department, Firefighters Association for the Fire Department, uh, Treatment and Patrol, uh, and then also Supervisors Unit, just to name uh, some of those. So you're right, we have to individually negotiate with each of them uh, before we could implement any sort of uh, labor concession to help assist in the balancing of the budget. Has that process started, the negotiation? Absolutely. Conversations uh, began right away. It's uh, you know, I look at kind of different levers that you're going to be able to pull to manage yourself out of this financial situation. It's similar to 2010 when we did this, but much worse. Uh, but it is, it's reduction in services. It's having to thin the organization even more. We're already 100 positions less than we were in 2010. So uh, we've already kind of cut off a, a some of the low hanging fruit operationally. So this is gonna be hard. You look at that, you look at your capital program, your one-time expenditures and put a hold or defer uh, capital expenditures as best you can. Uh, I think it is okay in this crisis to look at the use of reserves to bridge a gap until you right size an organization. That's why you have reserves. How much, and if how much this do is, we have in reserve? So we got about 25% of the operating budget reserves, which is quite good. And we're at fully funded reserves going into this, which was very fortunate. So it's about $32 million. 22. Okay. 32, $32 million. Uh, I suspect we're gonna use seven to $10 million of that just between now and, and June 30th because the, the crisis has hit us so swiftly. Uh, so I think it's prudent to use some of that, but you don't want to use all your reserves because you never know when the next disaster is going to hit us. And unfortunately, they keep coming at us pretty fast. Uh, and then you look at labor concessions as a possibility. And then the one thing which I am not planning on and not budgeting for, but might occur is some sort of federal relief to states and local governments. And that's being debated hotly in Washington right now. Yeah, we really um, got screwed there. I mean, both the county and the, uh, and the city, yep. obviously, you had to be yep. a I think what six or seven cities in California only qualified for that because you have to be 500,000. So That's right. what's the outlook on that? Do you, do you what a salute thing? I mean, he, I talked to him. He's going to fight as hard as he can, whatever, but he will. Yeah. You know, I think all, the salute's been fantastic. He was calling me right on day one and saying, what do we need and what can we do? Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of caught up in the red versus blue fight that's going on in Washington, DC. And there's a feeling that cities are dominated by the blue Democrats. And so, you know, we don't want to bail them out is what the Senate Republicans rhetoric is. Um, Trump on his tweets, President Trump has gone both ways. He's been supportive on some tweets and he's been discouraging on others. Uh, so I, it, it's hard to predict how that'll all come out. So I know you can't talk about the specifics of these negotiations, but you know, just uh, in, in general, uh, are, are you talking about layoffs? Are you talking about furloughs? Are you talking about pay cuts, all of the above? Hard to predict at this point. Um, it's always a dance you kind of have to go through until you get to that final package when you're having to negotiate with the labor unions. And I just want to first stay off, say they have been great. They've been meeting with us. They understand. Uh, and they're at the table talking to us. But the final package um, could be layoffs, could be furloughs instead of layoffs, uh, or some combination thereof. We always try to avoid layoffs. Uh, we were successful 10 years ago to avoid layoffs of permanent employees. Um, 
but this is steep and hard. So I, I, hard for me to predict exactly where it all comes out. We're working on that right now as a department head team, putting together different scenarios and packages. We'll spend the month, second half of May, uh, presenting those to council for consideration. And then in June, we'll put a package together. And my prediction, Jerry, is we'll put a package together that gets us a balanced budget based upon what we know. And then we'll be back at it six months from now when we get uh, quicker information. I, I just think we're gonna have to continually be evaluating what's happening in real time on the ground. So um, again, you know, we obviously don't know the specifics, but how does this manifest in decrease for services? I mean, how, how, how are residents gonna experience this? That's what we're evaluating now, and you try to minimize that, but I'm not sure that we are gonna feel this one. Uh, again, I think we were pretty successful 10 years ago to minimize the impact of services such that I don't think there's a lot of give left. Um, you know, and it's, it's a tricky balance and I, I don't know exactly how it's going to come out, but you try to preserve your public safety first. Uh, that is kind of job one for a city organization, but then that leaves the pressure on your parks and recreation programs and library services as kind of the other two big movers. And those are really things that we appreciate and enjoy about living in Santa Barbara is having access to those great services. So it's a hard one, but I don't want to give any false hope that, you know, the community is not going to feel any reduction in services out of this. This is a pretty remarkable downturn uh, in revenues and impact to the, the city. Okay. Uh, and then uh, on the budget, uh, Measure C, uh, which um, was approved in uh, 2017, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, increase in sales tax specifically for a new police station and infrastructure repair. Is that going to be on the table? Are those, is that money? And obviously it's reduced uh, from what had been projected because of the downturn in the sales tax, but is that going to be part of the solution or is that going to be kind of held sacrosanct? So I think going in, uh, the feeling is to try to hold that sink or sink. They will have, we'll have to adjust our Measure C budget for the loss in Measure C revenues. Uh, so I think that is, is absolutely expected. Uh, technically, council could use that money to help balance the general fund. It was passed as a general tax with 50% voter approval. Uh, so legally, that is an option available to council. But I think council is very sensitive to the promise made to the voters of this is for infrastructure and critical infrastructure needs. Um, but I'm not going to take it completely off the table. I want council to have that flexibility when they kind of look at the final package to make the right choice in their mind as to what to do. Okay. All right. So uh, we just hired, or you just hired, a new economic development director, Jason Harris. And that was one of the recommendations of this, uh, of the Cosmot report, this big consultant study of uh, uh, how the city uh, deals with business. How will you measure his success? Um, you know, how are you going to determine uh, whether what, 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 he's done the right thing or the wrong thing? Yeah, you know, uh, I am so thankful that I got him on board just as this pandemic was starting. And I'm so thankful that he showed up. I, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm wondering how thankful he is. Exactly. You know, because this is, like I said, it's all hands on deck. And it's so helpful to have an experienced person to walk into the building and help us kind of manage our way through this because the economic recovery is crisis two that's staring us down. Uh, and so his leadership on that is crucial. His, uh, he's a quick study. He's been meeting and talking to a lot of folks. He's also bringing his experience from Santa Monica and other uh, economic development jobs that he's had in the past. So that's helpful. Um, Boy, again, you know, I, I hate to kind of duck your question, but, you know, how do you judge success? Um, it's, there's so much why, uncertainty why, right why now. Why change now? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 it's, again, it's all of us working together. It's the property owners, it's the retailers, it's the businesses, it's the community, it's being creative, it's trying new things. I think if anything, this crisis is giving us a much broader swath of opportunity uh, to try something new because uh, not only are we trying to reopen but you're competing with every other community that's trying to reopen and so what's going to make Santa Barbara special again and really shine. Yeah there's been some criticism uh, you know that you didn't hire somebody local that you you, you went outside um, that he's not living here he, he, I guess he's resident in Thousand Oaks uh, what's your response to that? You know, uh, fair comments. I, I get that. I also feel that 
Uh, if I had hired local, I would have been criticized for not bringing in a fresh idea and new face because, you know, if it wasn't working that great beforehand, why aren't you bringing in someone from outside that has new ideas? I personally thought it was a coup to get someone from the city of Santa Monica that we often look to is kind of a similar type city, different scale, but still similar type issues. And I think it's great to get fresh ideas. Um, I think it's good for him to come in and kind of challenge the internal orthodoxy that we all have as Santa Barbarans. We kind of feel we're in this special little bubble uh, and we know how it's done. So I think it's good to bring someone in. And then where he lives, I, you know, judge him on his work product, not, not on his residency. There's a lot of great uh, community leaders in town and don't happen to live in Santa Barbara. Uh, so he's not alone in that way. Um, we all have different family challenges and stuff. Uh, give the guy a chance and let him prove it on the ground. He's also shown that he's very committed when he takes a job, he sticks with it. So I think he's here for the long run. All right. Now we got this mayor's task force um, on economic recovery, which has 17 or 22 members, I guess, depending on what day it is. Um, I saw the minutes of the first meeting it, and there's a reference to the city county business sector reopening plan. It looks yeah. like the county is taking this over. Is that, is that, am I reading that right? No, not quite. Um, so two things going on. One, we had the first meeting of the mayor's business advisory task force, and it was a great meeting. Everyone showed up on two days notice. They spent two and a half hours on the phone, uh, generated a lot of good ideas to initially start with. So I was very pleased and impressed with the contributions we were getting from everyone. We're going to focus into subgroups and, and subcommittees to try to focus on some areas and to kind of bring some packages together. And then what the county is doing, the county is working on a reopening plan. Uh, and that's something they'll feed up to the state of California. And they're modeling it on what San Luis Obispo, who's a couple weeks ahead of Santa Barbara County, their numbers are better on, on reopening and that sort of stuff. A uh, consultant group called REACH, so you often hear it referred to kind of as a REACH study or whatever. And so they are also looking at compiling kind of best practices with a public health standpoint of how the operations will go. And so a lot of the members on the business advisory task force are on different subcommittees that the county is putting together we will also have the opportunity to contribute to that. But that is more kind of on a public health led reopening plan, uh, how the businesses are going to interact with that. And then I think what the mayor's business action task force will continue to do then is what kind of promotions do we need to be doing locally? What kind of local ordinance changes or different uses of the public right of way should we be looking at? Uh, so I think they're complementary, but not duplicative. And is the mayor's task force also looking at sort of longer range, broader issues, you know, should we continue to depend on tourism and retail? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, is, that, is that on the table? Not so much. Uh, the idea of this task force was to focus on three to six months. What are we going to do when we start reopening to try to give retail and restaurants a chance to reopen? Um, I, I, I think we shouldn't be, I, I think we should be uh, chastened to think that it's going to be hard when we reopen. What's the public sentiment going to be? Are we all going to be excited to go to restaurants? What if the guidance is that they're only at half capacity? Is that sufficient for restaurants to survive? Uh, and so that retail, you know, if the retail component is you have to pick it up outside on the curb, how successful is retail going to be? And so this is just a real short focus of how do we kind of rebuild the confidence of locals to come back downtown and, and shop and participate? What kind of new ideas and energy can we bring to the table? And then I think the long range plan and kind of has to follow that. But, you know, we've got this huge crisis. We got to focus on the near term first just to get people back on their feet and stabilized again uh, and then talk about longer term visions. All right. Well, the, obviously, the other big issue for the business community, and it was also in the consultants report, is a community development department, mm -hmm. which has been a target of complaint uh, over its kind of tangled bureaucracy. How do you think Garden Street is operating? What grade would you give them used to run that department? Yeah, I did. You know, I'm not going to get into giving it a grade, but it's clearly a challenge. Uh, the community, you know, community is always somewhat frustrated with 630 Garden Street, but there's really been frustration over the last three years or so, uh, or, or so. So we are working on that. Um, I got to give them kudos through this pandemic, uh, the way they pivoted and got to online submittals of all 
Uh, Smittles, we stayed open through this. We have been processing building permits. We have been conducting building inspections out in the field uh, with remote technology, very creative, and it's been very successful. We got our design review board meetings up and running with this type of technology, which is extremely labor intensive and difficult to do with all your volunteer board members and applicants, but we've got those up and running. So we've kept the, the wheels moving of the system. Uh, and so I give them credit for that. But clearly we've got work to do and we've got work to do on a number of fronts. We've got work to do in-house within the building itself. How effective are we at uh, doing building permit plan checks, turning those around faster, getting people ready to construct. We've brought in this outside consultant who's giving an outside fresh look at that and analyzing that and we'll be bringing recommendations back. Uh, design review boards is another issue. We've done additional training with them to try to help them focus and get people through that part of the system faster that is kind of a community public minded process uh, that you know we don't control as much uh, but that's a challenge as well so I think we get that there's issues to be working on and we're working hard. Well, how, how would you you know in 25 words or less I mean what do you hear the criticism to be what do you what do you uh, what do you what's your when you say we got to fix this what are you trying to fix? 25 words or less that's all right so now you only got 18 left now <laughs> Um, multiple things. One, I think there is frustration with the federal Americans with Disability Act and change of use requirements and what that triggers in some of our older uh, stock of commercial buildings in the downtown core makes it very expensive sometimes to do a change of use. And so trying to see if there's a way that we can work within the federal guidance on that. Stormwater management permit uh, is a real challenge. It's technical in the weeds, but I hear that all the time from the development community that the permit we have in hand now is really inflexible and extremely expensive. So we're in the process of bringing back some modifications to that but we have to get approval from the Regional Water Quality Control Board for that permit, so uh, that. And then the just constant timeliness and no late hits. Don't give us new information on the second or third plan check. Uh, honor what you said the first time around, and can we get things out faster, faster, faster? Time is money, and we get that. All right, so bottom line, is George Buell doing a good job or a bad job? George Buell has a challenge on his hands and uh, we need to see improvement there. And I think he understands that as well. All right. Uh, we heard about this deal uh, this week with the owners of Paseo Nuevo with the mall uh, to extend their lease uh, through 2065. And there've been questions raised about the wisdom of doing this given the downward direction of brick and mortar retail in general. What are the pluses and minuses of this deal that you see? So, Quick little backstory. So Paseo Nuevo, uh, city owns the land underneath, former redevelopment project, and there's three separate leases. Nordstrom's, the Ortega building, the old Macy's, and then the middle part, the mall. So what we're talking about is just the middle part of the mall. Uh, the owner of that long-term lease went to Historic Landmarks Commission and got a plan to revitalize and rejuvenate that middle part of the mall. And came to council with some deal points and said, will you enter into an agreement to extend our lease in exchange for us making these improvements? And council said yes, but that was a little over a year ago. Uh, they said, great, we're going to take your word on it. And we're going to start investing now. Uh, and so what we brought back Tuesday was, okay, we need to now kind of finalize that agreement. So we just brought those term sheets back, councils turn over. I think we have three new council members since that time. So that's what was happening on Tuesday. The benefits, you've got a major property owner in downtown investing $20 million improving their property. I think that's pretty good right now. Uh, you know, I kind of side with that's outstanding. I hope other people are able to reinvest in their properties to that kind of magnitude. And you, you feel it sends a strong signal about the, like, the, the perceived vitality of that. Yeah, and, and long-term commitment to the property and the fact that they've been doing it for the last year and continue to finish it now uh, under this situation, I think speaks to there is a future. And on the retail question, I think everyone agrees we have too much retail in Santa Barbara. Uh, it's more than the population of the South Coast can really support even with tourism. But I think the heart of retail is still gonna be there. There's still gonna be a retail experience and I think Paseo Nuevo being the center and focus of that uh, makes a lot of sense going forward. So quite honestly, I say thank you to them for uh, reinvesting in Santa Barbara and hope that more property owners can continue to do so as well. Uh, the other chronic issue or, or uh, one other chronic issue downtown of course is homelessness. Yeah. Um, a lot of um, 
concerns about that. What's the city, what's the city's long-term strategy for, for dealing with homeless? You know, the long-term strategy is the same that every other city in the United States is grappling with, is trying to find something that works effectively in the long term. If there was a city that has the exact model, we'd all be copying it. Uh, but it's housing first seems to be the, the current thought is that you have to try to provide more housing and give people an option to get off the street. Uh, and so working with the housing authority, building more affordable housing uh, for that sort of stuff. I think the city net team that we've had out on the street for a year or so now is showing to be very effective when they've got the ability to approach people and give them a place to go. The Cacique Street uh, cleanup uh, is in great credit to their uh, deft ability to kind of work with that population and, and help them find uh, better locations. So it's a combination of outreach teams on the street, uh, but we've got to find a way to get the housing to give them a place to go as well. What about the mental health and addiction element of that? I mean, uh, yep. you have to expand services of that or how's that gonna go? Yeah, and that's working with the county and, and social service providers. So, I mean, homeless is so complicated because some are economically homeless, some have mental health challenges, some have substance abuse challenges. Uh, it's just no one size fits all for every person that you see in the street. And then you have got the young travelers who are just kind of by choice, you know, kind of <laughs> making the rounds up and down the coast of Oregon and California. And so it's coming up with multi different efforts to try to address all those different components. But yes, what we call wraparound services. You need to get people into housing, but you have to give them services to give them a chance to get uh, back on their feet and solid footing. Yeah, one quick question about the Cacique uh, cleanup. Uh, I, I was interviewing the police chief as it happened uh, at the same time I was going on. She didn't know about it. Why, why, why didn't she get a heads up on that? Ah, uh, she knew about it. Um, it, it yeah, you know, I, I, yeah. I watched your interview with Lori and, you know, your question, she kind of gave the answer of the day. Uh, but quite honestly, it wasn't until Tuesday morning. When did you interview Lori? I think you were interviewed her on Monday. Good morning. It, when? Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning. So, you know, the CityNet team went out there and bless them, they were fantastic and got it cleared that morning. And I don't think we were expecting uh, that quick a success. And so I saw Brad Fieldhouse with CityNet Tuesday morning and he stopped me on the road and he says, it's all cleared. And I was like, wow, I'd shake your hand if I could. Uh, so, you know, they, a lot of credit to them, a lot of credit to Jeff Schaefer with SB Act for helping to coordinate that. Laura Doubles from our team. Uh, Chief Luna works closely with all of them. It has been a coordinated effort, uh, but it's the outreach teams who, who really got that cleared in a hurry and, and all the credit to them. All right. Uh, you're getting a lot of incoming uh, these days. Uh, there's a faction of the business and development community, Ed St. George and others, who are basically after your job. Mm -hmm. um, there's a new uh, piece up, Newshawk just posted, Montecito Journal's got a cover story uh, that goes after you as well. Um, so this letter that was published in Newshawk said, we don't need a city administrator who has spent nearly half a decade simply working to preserve the status quo. Santa Barbara needs, desperately needs creative and courageous leadership from our city administrator's office. Fair criticism or not? Don't know who it's from. You didn't mention the name. Ed I haven't read it. Ed St. George and a number of his uh, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, um, I get it. Uh, you, city managers and city administrators are uh, often in the line of fire in lots of communities and you're seeing it even more so now up and down the state with the challenges we're going to have ahead of us and i appreciate uh ed's commitment to the community uh, he is a very community oriented guy uh, and i do the best i can and i work with the council and we try to come up with packages and ideas and let's be creative and let's work together i think we'll be more effective if we're pulling on the same side of the rope rather than working against each other i just think santa barbara is much better when we're in a collaborative mode than we're in a fighting mode uh, but i hear the criticism i get it i've met with ed uh, so I, i've heard it directly from him as well and i keep wake up every day and give 110 percent to this community like i have what keeps you up at night everything <laughs> it's really hard right now jerry uh like i said it's the three-pronged challenge uh, it's making sure we're making good decisions from a public health standpoint which is not always in the city's wheelhouse we don't have a public health department so we're making trying to make good judgments and i think the council has with their leadership and credit to them uh the economic calamity that we are facing um, 
I get it. This is going to be brutal. This is really hard. People are out of jobs left and right across. How do we recover and get people stabilized again? And the downfall of that. And then the personal anguish of leading an organization of 1,500 people and going through a financial crisis like this and the tough decisions I know we're going to have to make and the potential impacts it has on the services we provide that we really enjoy providing. And then the employees. We're a caring organization. We're a family. And so this is a tough time. So it's the combination of that uh it's a lot of pressure keeps you up it's tough last really quick question uh what's the biggest difference between working with a, a city uh, an at-large council and a district election council uh, i love all my councils they're all great <laughs> yeah not to duck your question okay you know i, I work for whoever the public uh, elects it's just it's it's the profession i'm in it's the profession i chose it's the profession i enjoy and actually i i appreciate the elected officials who step up and decide to run, because talk about a thankless job. Um, I've got a lot of targets on my back and arrows coming my way. They get it all the time as well. And, but they raised their hand and said, you know what, for very little money, I'm willing to put myself out there and try to help lead this community. And I really respect that. All right, Paul Casey, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, uh, giving us such a broad uh, look at what's going on with the city and uh, stay safe and uh, good luck. We'll talk thank you, Jerry. Take care.